next up, we have How to Sell Youth Culture with Ian Beckman Regan. Thanks, everyone. Imagine you're in university and you just made a new friend. Getting to know each other, you go out for drinks, go to concerts, introduce him to your other friends. Now, think about how you'd feel after learning he's actually a researcher sent by Nike to document the youth culture of your city, and you're his case study. This is a true story told to me by Ruta Ribeiro, a former cultural marketing manager for Nike. Hi, everyone. My name's Ian, and today I'm gonna to tell you a little story about brands, youth culture, and identity. Brands are this crazy thing, right? It feels like they're everywhere all the time. In fact, the average American sees four to 10,000 ads per day. They're plastered across our towns and cities, on our phones and in our homes on TV, messages telling us how to think and act, what to buy. It's almost as if they're following us. Brands reinforce the myth that identity is a lifelong project constructed in part by consumerism. But behind the shiny veneer of marketing, brands are filled with contradictions. These paradoxes are all around us. Brands advertise self-expression while selling conformity. They celebrate co-creation, but in reality are in the business of control. And they promote social causes while obscuring their ethical ambiguities. From a young age, we're taught to be ambivalent about the consequences these tensions have on our identity. So what happens when the teen on the street and the teen in the ad lock eyes? Who's being made by who? Stuck in a vicious cycle, youth culture and consumerism are deeply intertwined. Today, teens and brands are interdependent. But this wasn't always the case. It was invented. In fact, we can look back in history and pinpoint a specific moment in time when consumerism invented the American teenager. Let's go back to the 1940s. Photographer Nina Lean's 1944 photo essay for Life magazine begins with this line. There's a time in the life of every American girl when the most important thing in the world is to be one of a crowd of other girls and to act and speak and dress exactly as they do. This is the teen age. The word teenager was first published only a few years earlier in a 1941 issue of Popular Science magazine. World War II was nearing its end, ushering in a new era of affluence in the United States. For the first time in the nation's history, more than half of young adults completed high school. Meanwhile, the rise in part-time jobs during and after the war meant teens had spare change in their pocket and a hunger to spend it. By the end of the decade, the buying power of American teens reached $8 billion. Music, movies, candy, comics, fashion, beauty, youth culture, and the teen consumer were born. Brands positioned the teenager as distinct from children and distinct from adults. A new market founded on the pursuit of defiance and authenticity, the teen is the ultimate symbol of experimentation and rule breaking. And I love this movie poster from 1948. The tagline reads, hot rod teenagers living on the razor edge of danger, stumbling into crime, tumbling into love, too mixed up to know what they're doing. Case in point. The invention of the teen consumer proved marketing's power not only to manufacture desire, but also to create images that define mass culture, reinforcing what's considered normal and acceptable. In this case, being white, skinny, and heterosexual, or as sociologist Talcott Parsons, who coined the term youth culture, puts it, the bad boys and the glamour girls. Seventeen Magazine, launched in 1944, was one of the earliest publications to commercialize youth culture. The key innovation to Seventeen's success was its mastery of the feedback loop. Teach companies all about teen preferences while shaping teen des teens' desires for those very same brands. Conformity sold as self-expression. And this wasn't theoretical. It was a very specific role pioneered by the magazine's promotional director, Estelle Ellis, inventor of an influential marketing campaign named Tina, the prototypical teenage girl. Tina transformed the idea of the teen generation into a market personification, a composite based on the magazine's readership. Seventeen surveyed teens' hobbies, their anxieties, and their spending habits, and then flipped these findings 
distributing them to advertisers, retailers, and manufacturers, not unlike today's data economy. From the start of the teen market revolution, businesses like Seventeen saw youth culture as a lucrative and quantifiable market that could be sold a predetermined identity. In the teen search for self, brands tell her to choose from the catalog. But teens have always been nimble. Using new media and technology to push the edges of culture, teens influence brands, and then brands sell it back to them in a perpetual cycle of influence. Now, we're going to jump forward in time to present day, and I'll demonstrate how this feedback loop pioneered by Seventeen Magazine is still very much alive today, and perhaps even stronger than ever. I want you to think about this. You don't need to be a teenager to be sold youth culture. I'll say it again slightly differently. Youth culture is sold to all of us. Nike understands this better than anyone. In a 1992 Harvard Business Review profile, Nike co-founder Phil Knight said, for years we thought of ourselves as a production-oriented company, meaning we put all our emphasis on designing and manufacturing the product. We've come around to saying that Nike is a marketing-oriented company, and the product is our most important marketing tool. And it's clear that it's working. For the past 12 years, Nike has won the title of Americans, American teens' favorite footwear and clothing brand by a wide margin, according to one of the largest teen market research surveys in the country. So just how big is this mar marketing juggernaut? Today, Nike's empire is worth an estimated 193.5 billion US dollars. To put it in perspective, they sell 25 pairs of sneakers every second. By the time I'm finished with this presentation, Nike will have sold 15,000 pairs of sneakers worth approximately $660,000. But Nike doesn't just sell sneakers and apparel. They operate a content empire, not unlike Disney or Marvel. The only difference is that we're the characters living in the brand's fiction. Nike's recently published book, No Finish Line, features speculative fiction and essays on the next 50 years of design and sport. Its new podcast, No Off Season, explores mental health with star athletes. In China, Nike's now the official sponsor of the eSports League of Legends Pro League. Working out at home has never been easier, thanks to the Nike Training Club series, now streaming on Netflix. And Nike even held an award show last year hosted by Drake. Like an entertainment layer on top of reality, Nike's story world continues to grow as consumers become active participants in its co-creation. Just last month, Nike launched Dot Swoosh, self-described as a new community experience designed to give you the opportunity to co-create the future of Nike through virtual fa fashion NFTs. Nike constantly promotes the idea of co-creation, but in reality, they're the ones who benefit from our work as consumers refashioned as creative participants. So what happens when a brand as popular as Nike shapes the attitudes of youth culture? I interviewed a handful of Gen Zers, including Austin, to find out. <laughs> Here's what a few of them told me. I know, a lot of, I know a lot of these campaigns about diversity or sustainability are just to hide the fact that they get everything made in sweatshops and a lot of other gross stuff that they do. Another told me, I think their products are trustworthy and good quality, but I don't think they're an ethical company. And a third, I don't believe in a lot of, if any, multi million dollar brands missions and commitments to do good but if they're giving marginalized people a platform that's good even if it's small and they're not alone in feeling this way i know i'm implicated in it too and i think we all are when a brand is as ubiquitous and as loved as nike it can seem unchangeable it's easy for us to look the other way and become complacent especially when Nike claims to be a leader in, and I'm saying this in massive buzzword scare quotes, social impact and corporate social responsibility. Nike positions itself as a platform for youth culture, seducing emerging talent with the promise of global exposure and mainstream recognition. But Nike builds its influence and credibility on the backs of those very same subcultures. In other words, Nike sells the image of empowerment rather than empowerment itself. The result? happy, powerless consumers that feel seen. Is Nike in the business of changing social norms or explore, exploiting subcultures? Can it do both at the same time? Several years ago, in celebration of Pride Month, 
Nike launched a campaign centered around the art of voguing, featuring a ballroom dancer and transgender activist, Laomi Maldonado. The campaign earned significant praise and media coverage, shining a spotlight on the ballroom scene, ushering it into the mainstream and foretelling popular TV shows like Pose, Legendary, and My House, as well as Beyonce's Renaissance era. On its face, the campaign might seem well-intentioned, and in fairness to Nike, it helped give a voice to a marginalized community while celebrating the incredible artistry and athleticism of voguing, but I couldn't help but question what was in it for Nike. To quote sociologists Robert Goldman and Stephen Papson, Nike ads have garnered public admiration because they seem to speak in a voice of honesty and authenticity. Paradox paradoxically, its aura of authenticity has been a product of its willingness to address alienated spectators about feeling alienated from media contrived images. I want to be clear, what's at stake here isn't just financial. It's social, it's political, and it's cultural. It's a world where consumerism leaves us complacent, unable to imagine something better. It's a world where the teen on the street and the teen in the ad are increasingly entangled, and it's a world where brands know us better than we know ourselves. If there's one thing I want to leave you with, it's this. This isn't just a story about Nike or Seventeen magazine. It's about how our identities are shaped from a young age by brands. But by shining a light on the system that's been at work since the 1940s, my hope is that we don't just do it, and instead we think about what brands do to us. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Give it up one more time for Ian. Uh, great job. Let's do the hug thing because we're just doing it now. And I was just imagining giving hugs and like the audience can see your face when I'm doing the hug. And I was like worried people were being kind of, like scared when they were doing it. Um, anyway, congratulations, Ian. I, I need to ask the audience, who is wearing Nike right now? Hands, 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 hands. Okay, okay. I, okay, I thought there would be more. Who, who owns Nike? Okay, there we go, there we go. And you are, you are wearing? Nike. Nike, we love Nike. I also, I own Nike. Um, no, I don't own the company. Um, I probably wouldn't be here, but um, what was I gonna ask you? Okay, what were you like as a teen? I was <clears throat> a shy band geek. Well, now you have a mic. Uh, were you a, a what were you what did you play alto saxophone okay okay how is that different from a regular saxophone oh it's uh higher than a tenor and a berry but lower than a, than a soprano okay 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 i was just quizzing you i was just quizzing you i was just quizzing you um <laughs> sorry um i was more like tina when i was a teen she's kind of like doing a lot of shopping and running around and um, but yeah, that was really incredible. You, I feel like, did a lot of like archive research. Is that right? I've, how did you feel about archive research? It was really fun, and I was surprised by how much there is online. Like the Tina stuff came from the Smithsonian's digital archive, and there was just so much to dig into. Yeah, because I feel like you really were digging in. You had those amazing quotes. So I was just really, really like, it was it was amazing to see this, like my teenage life kind of like showed back to me. Um, so I think you did a really amazing job and um, great presentation. Are you, you came from the branding world. Are you, are you going back? Hopefully with a clearer conscious and, you know, a mission and uh, a difference to, to make. Okay, that's what we'd like to hear. Thank you, Ian. Give it up one more time for Ian.